This week, Call of Duty WW2 is set to unleash itself upon the general populace. Pre-release copies have already begun to find their way into the hands of many consumers who quickly discovered that the disc inside the box was essentially worthless, due to the fact that it did not actually contain the game on it. Much like last year's Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5, the game and all its modes were completely unplayable until players downloaded a 9 gigabyte patch. A patch that was in fact not even available to people on the first day who had already received a copy. But where is Pro Skater 5? was a somewhat niche release that Activision was clearly experimenting with. This is Call of Duty. We can scoff at that fact and we may mock it, but that doesn't change that Call of Duty is debatably the biggest video game in modern pop culture and is always a monster on the sales charts, even when it underperforms. Call of Duty has the power to drastically affect the zeitgeist of gaming, and Activision just released it as essentially an empty box and a patch. You cannot play this game in any capacity if you do not connect to the internet. For all intents and purposes, they just released a COD game as a digital download exclusive, and they didn't tell anyone. This has all kinds of dicey implications, none of which are particularly exciting for anyone who has to or wants to actually play these things. But I feel it does give us a good chance to ask a couple age-old questions. Given the drastic rise in popularity of digital distribution and the clear push by major publishers to move games to that marketplace over the past decade, and how it's typically been handled, how much longer will the digital games we own be around? What if the companies we bought those digital games from collapsed? What does this pick up now, download later approach that Activision is clearly gunning for mean for us? And most of all, how much do we actually own our games, especially the ones that are dependent on digital downloads? That last question has differing levels of implication depending on where you buy your games. But for the most common places you buy them, your Steams, your PSNs, your Xbox marketplaces and so on, there's no guarantee you'll get to keep those games for as long as you have access to your account. Broadly speaking, when it comes to digital goods, we have entered a post-ownership world. An era defined by finite licenses and, as such, no guarantee that the games you buy with these companies will find their way into your hands should they ever shut down. To be clear, I don't think Valve or Sony or Microsoft will be going out of business anytime soon. But let's not pretend that companies as big or bigger than them have never turned to ash seemingly overnight. This is within the realm of possibility. Currently, the closest thing we have to truly insured digital purchases are companies like Good Old Games, which release DRM-free versions of their products, thereby letting the consumers have a say in how long they get to hold on to their copy. The much larger Steam, however, has opted to simply promise to adopt a similar policy to GOG should they ever go out of business, even though they have no legal obligation to. We have no true insurance that the games we own will remain ours for as long as we possess our accounts. There's a good reason why their end-user license agreement Agreement is called the Steam Subscribers License, and why it contains both a no guarantee and limitation of liability clause. Because they want to make sure that worst case scenario, they can just stand up and walk away. And yes, I know this is typically standard legalese, but A, doesn't change that that's what it's set up to allow them to do and can be used to potentially screw us out of massive piles of money, and we need to keep that in mind. And B, it is worth noting that GOG does not have a clause like this. Also, quick side note, while researching this, I discovered while they don't have that, they do have a clause saying that even if they decide to ban you from GOG, they'll try to give you a chance to download all of your DRM-free games before you go. Good on you, GOG. This isn't a commercial for GOG, I swear. Point is, as we progress further and further into this realm of digital goods, we need to begin ensuring that we aren't going to wake up one day and find that accounts worth upwards of thousands of dollars have simply vanished into the ether. Maybe at a different time and place it was a good idea to place our blind faith in our Lord and Savior Gaben, but are we really going to trust modern day Valve to fulfill a single promise they aren't 100% legally obligated to? I mean, this is the company that in recent history has done everything it can to get out of doing any kind of work it can manage, that let Greenlight become a trash can of every kind of garbage imaginable, and, at the time of writing, has plans to try to sell you Pickle Rick. Would you trust the company that is trying to sell you Pickled Rick to protect all of your gaming purchases? Because that's currently what we're doing. We are looking at that company and saying, yes, I trust you to protect my purchases, even though you've explicitly written it into our agreement that you don't have to. I know we all know this already, but it bears repeating because it is entirely too easy to forget. Until the exact moment that not just Valve, but every digital storefront updates its terms of service with a clause that protects consumers, every purchase you make from them is temporary, a long-form rental. And given the low prices Steam so often has, you could argue that it's still a good deal even if they do just turn out to be rentals, which seems like it might be a good point until you think about it for more than five seconds. First off, these aren't being sold as rentals. 
They're being sold as products. When I go to buy Pickled Rick during its inevitable and glorious release, it's not going to say, rent for myself. It's going to say, purchase for myself. And the idea of capital P purchasing a product has an air of permanence to it. It automatically feels like you paid for a thing and you now have the thing because you just paid for it and it is now yours until it leaves your life due to your actions, be it a deliberate throwing away or accidental loss. Every step of the way, it's designed to feel permanent, to trick your reptile brain into thinking it's yours forever. And it's like this for the overwhelming majority of digital storefronts. And that is a problem waiting to happen. To be clear, I'm not saying that digital distribution is bad and we should get rid of it. Digital distribution is ostensibly a good thing. It's cheap and accessible to nearly every developer out there and is almost solely responsible for bringing me dozens of my favorite games that otherwise might not have gotten a release. I love digital distribution, but it does have its problems and we can't just ignore them and hope we never have to deal with them. We need to know what's going to happen to the things we paid for, both for our sake and the sake of preservation. What happens when I want to play my copy of Sakura Santa on Steam and there's suddenly no more Steam? Or going down the path of bad endings that have already begun to kick in, what's going to happen when a different game that means even more to me is taken down from Steam because of licensing issues? Let's not forget that earlier this year, Alan Wake was removed from old digital storefronts due to an expired music license. It wasn't the greatest game ever, but it was worth playing. Thankfully, you can still play Alan Wake. Physical copies of it do exist and will continue to do so. However, in the same situation with a digital-only game, it would simply be gone. A masterful piece of art could just vanish. Let us not forget what Konami did to PT, after all. May it rest in peace. And I don't think it will be the last time we see a masterpiece from a famed director's catalog dissipate into the ether. The obvious answer to this whole situation is simply, well, you should buy physical games then if it worries you so much. And that answer does potentially solve the problem. However, as we're seeing here, that solution may ultimately be a finite one. The sales of digital games increase every year, and with that increase, so too does the number of games exclusively released digitally. It's reached the point to where even AAA games are beginning to engage in this practice, with last year's Hitman being available in its entirety three months before it finally saw a physical release. And this is to say nothing of smaller games. I think Bastion is a borderline perfect game, but I couldn't go out and buy a physical copy of it because physical copies of it do not exist. As more and more games become digital only, this becomes less and less of an option. Prior to this week, it was my general belief that we were trending towards a scene of gaming that looked not all too dissimilar to music, where digital purchases are the rule and physical copies of successful products are more of a luxury for collectors. After all, this has already happened with PC gaming as is, and the majority of publishers have made it no secret that they'd prefer it to be this way. And honestly, if that were the path we were going down, I'd be fairly comfortable with that. However, after this whole thing, my belief is a little shaken, to say the least. Because as scummy as the music industry can be, I've never, ever heard of any record label selling a physical album to people where the vinyl jacket has nothing in it beyond a download code for iTunes, and then they proceed to act like it's just completely normal. And why would they? It would be absolutely absurd. But that's essentially what's happening here. This week, we are going to be sold one of the biggest releases of the year in the form of what seems to be a physical product. It's shaped like one, you'll have to drive somewhere to pick it up and put it in a console in order to play it. It will look like a physical game, but it's not. It's a ticket to download the game online, and that ticket is only good for as long as Activision feels like cashing it in, or is able to for that matter. Whatever you may think of them, GameStop seems to be the primary reason physical games are still considered the default. After all, what other company is pushing specifically physical games half as hard as them? But it's no secret that they're doing worse and worse every year. And if and when their main commercial supporter vanished from the scene, physical games would most likely fall by the wayside, restricted to the role of enthusiast collectibles, much like vinyls, if even that. Given what we've seen from the history of physical PC games, Tony Hawk 5, and now Call of Duty, there's increasingly little promise that the game we purchase will even be in the box. And that, to be frank, is not fucking acceptable. You deserve to own the things you buy. You deserve the things you paid for. We all do, and I flat out refuse to entertain any notion to the contrary. This isn't about the evils of digital games versus the pure virtue of physical ones. This is about ownership and preservation. It's about the right to say that something is yours without some abstract entity having the power to decide to take it away from you. Without ownership, true personal ownership, the kind that authentic physical games and DRM-free digital ones alone can offer, our entire medium 
becomes fragile. It becomes a place where we have no choice but to blindly trust the stability and general responsibility of people we've never seen, never talked to, and most likely owe us nothing to legally support and protect not just one, not just dozens, but literally hundreds if not thousands of separate artworks. It becomes a place where amazing games can simply cease to exist. We've seen it happen before, and I think we can all agree that we should do what we can to prevent it from happening again.